Hazak Baruch, Hazak Baruch everyone for coming. Uh, those that are listening live and those that are listening uh, through the internet. Uh, this class as well, this specific class, is uh, dedicated by uh, my, my in-laws, uh, Michael and Emily Antar. Uh, um, my uh, their, their father, Rabbi Shlomo Lankri, um, my wife's grandfather, who uh, passed away actually um, on this day a couple of years ago. And many people know Rabbi Shlomo Lankri. He is somebody that serves the community uh, for free, uh, being part of the Hevra Kadisha. Um, and um, I'll never forget, um, I'll probably say it every year because it's just remarkable to me, you know, uh, this, this particular story about him. But my wife, she, she always reminds me how he, he called her over one time and he said to her, he said, uh, Frida, I want you to promise me that when I die, you're going to make the day a day of learning. And she started laughing. He's like, okay, Grandpa. He said, no, I'm not done. You got to make it a day of learning. And at the end of the day, it should be celebrated with a feast, with a seuda. And she laughed. He's like, okay, Grandpa, how am I going to do that? How am I going to pull that off? He said, don't worry, you're going to do it. Promise me. She said, okay, okay, I'll do it. And sure enough, he passed away on Shiva Asar Betamuz, a day that is a day of Torah learning the entire world around. And the end of the day is celebrated with a, uh, with a feast, with a seuda. Mezat um, Hashem, the words uh, as well today, should be Lelu Nishmat Shalomo Ben Rahil. Amen. Does anybody know how many days ago Shavuot was? I know. I didn't have to look at a calendar. I didn't have to calculate. I'll tell you how I know. But Shavuot was 40 days ago. And let me explain. Our rabbis tell us that this day, today, the fast day, the day of Shiva Asar Betamuz, we are mourning, and it's a day that we commence, we begin the mourning period of the destruction of the temple, which is going to uh, reach its peak on Tisha Be'av. And it's a three-week period of mourning that begins today, uh, on Shiva Asar Betamuz, on the 17th of Tammuz. And already from today, the laws of mourning uh, start to uh, kick into effect. As an example, beginning today, we don't listen to live music. Um, we don't say Shekhiyanu on new clothing. We try to minimize in Simcha. And then as we reach the nine days, the laws intensify. We don't have meats. And then the week of, we don't wear la freshly laundered clothing and we don't bathe. And then on the day of Tisha B'Av, even more uh, intense, it's the highest intensity where we don't eat and we don't wear lotion and we don't wash. Yeah, these are the laws of Tisha B'Av and they begin today. The mourning period for the destruction of, of the Beit HaMikdash begins today on Shiva Asar Betamuz. Because mourning, tragedy is a process. It doesn't happen in one day, it doesn't happen overnight. It starts slowly, slowly. Today it was the, it was the beginning of that process. And our rabbis tell us what happened today. What's so sad about today? Why are we fasting today? Tisha B'Av I get to destroy the Beit HaMikdash. But what happened today specifically? And our rabbis tell us in the Gemara five things. Hamisha Devarim. We are mourning today five things. Of course, we all know the first one. Hufke Ahair. That the walls of Jerusalem were breached. And eventually that led in three weeks from now to the destruction, to the burning down of the actual building. But the walls protecting the building, those walls of the city were breached today. They went through them today on Shavah Asar Betamuz, 3,000 plus years ago. Number two, number two, the tamid, the daily offering that we used to bring in the Beit HaMikdash, seized for a period of time on this day. Another thing that happened was a wicked uh, king burned a very important Sefer Torah to the Jewish people. It was a Torah that we looked to, uh, that we relied on. He burned that Torah. Number four was that a different enemy put a uh, tselem, a statue, in the Hechal. But my friends, number five is the one that I want to focus on today. And that is actually the first tragedy that ever happened on Shiva Asabat Tammuz. The first sad thing ever historically that happened today was the breaking of the tablets. Remember when Moshe Rabbeinu came down from Har Sinai, all excited, ready to give us the Torah, and what does he see? He sees us dancing around the Egel. And he takes the tablets and he breaks them. He breaks them in front of all of us. Everyone sees it. And the Jewish people, they, they, they're shaken from the breaking of the tablets. And how many days was Moshe on Har Sinai for? When he went up on Shavuot to get the Torah, he was there for 40 days. And he comes down, and 40 days later, he breaks the tablets. And that day was today. 
So I know that Shavuot was 40 days ago. Because today, Moshe broke the tablets. And 40 days ago, he went up to get them. And I think there's something so remarkable in the fact that the tragedy, that the morning begins with the Shvirat Haluchot. The morning, we cry. And it started today with the breaking of the tablets. That was the first thing that ever happened. And I think if we zoom in onto understanding the breaking of the tablets, then maybe we'll be able to come out in three weeks better, more successful, and Bezat Hashem with a verdict of redemption, of Geula, that Tisha B'Av can be this year a day of rejoicing. But we have to begin today, and we have to understand what unfolded today with the breaking of the Luchot. So I want to share with you one idea, and I'm sure there are many. But I want to just share with you one thought on the Shvirat HaLuchot. You know, Moshe Rabbeinu, when, he, um, when he's nearing the end of his life, it's actually the last few verses in the Torah. The Torah at the end lists all of Moshe's accomplishments. Yeah? If I tasked you to write a biography on Moshe Rabbeinu, what would you save for the end? The last, the cherry, the most beautiful. If you had to build his resume, the lowest, and then a little bit nicer, a little bit more impressive, the Torah does this all the way at the end. And I'll read to you the verses. The Basuk says, Velo kam navi od be Israel ke Moshe. There was never a history, a prophet like Moshe. Asher yidao Hashem panim panim, who God spoke to face to face. Wow. That's impressive. A prophet, never in history, equal to Moshe. Nice. What's next? Well, lechol haotot ve hamoftim asher shlacho Hashem laasot ve Yisraim. All of the miracles that he did in Egypt. Oh wow, yeah, that was pretty good. That was, he rocked, he rocked Misraim. That's also good. I like it. Put it down. What about the things he did in the desert? Bringing down the man, the water, the clouds, all the miracles that we had, that we experienced. Defeating Sichon, Og, all the miracles. Very nice. How, how are you going to top that one, Rabbi? Well, it says the next Pasuk, Lechol Ayada Chazaka. All of the strong hand, and the awesome power, Asher Asa Moshe Le'ene Kol Israel. And you know what else Moshe did? He did things with his hands, he had awesome power, and finally, that he did in front of the eyes of the Jewish people. And in those words, in front of the eyes of the Jewish people, our rabbis tell us is the most praiseworthy thing you could ever say about Moshe. What is it? What, what else could you add? Oh, I know you can say that he brought down the Torah. Wrong. That's already included in the first half of the Pasuk. Lechol ayada chazaka. That he brought down, says Rashi, shekibel et Torah beluchot beyadav. Well, then I'm lost. What else could you add? You already told me how he defeated Egypt and all the kings and all the miracles and he gave us the Torah. What else did Moshe do that is so praiseworthy that we didn't already include? Says the Says the Gemara, our rabbis tell us, you know what it includes? The greatest accolade is that Moshe Rabbeinu, Le'ene Kol Yisrael, in front of everybody, Shenesao Lebo Lishbor Haluchot, that he broke the tablets. The greatest thing we'll ever be able to say about Moshe Rabbeinu, if anyone asks you, what is the nice, what is the greatest thing? Can you really portray who he was? Answer, he broke the tablets. And this is mind-boggling. Because the tablets breaking was not an accomplishment. No, that was a mistake. That was a tragedy. That was something sad. That's why we're fasting. He had to break them, but he didn't want to break them. You think about Moshe Rabbeinu, he thinks the Jews are ready to receive the Torah. He pulls them to Ar Sinai. Guys, wait here. I'll be back in just a few days. He goes up, he comes down, Torah. And they're doing Avodah Zarah. They're sitting, dancing around the golden calf. And yet somehow our rabbis have the ability to say that actually Moshe Rabbeinu breaking those tablets was his greatest accomplishment. Why? How? So I want to speak for a few minutes about something that's called in psychology, cognitive dissonance 
But I don't want to really define the term. I want to really explain with an example. I know that uh, it's very popular these days to gamble. Unfortunately, it's very trending. FanDuel and all these other uh, holy websites that are uh, causing people, unfortunately, to lose so much of their lives, destroying their relationships and literally chips. Uh, but either way, I want to give an example from uh, a game of poker. Yeah? Maybe you've played poker before. Maybe you understand how the game works. But basically, you get two cards. And then there's five cards that are dealt on the table. And then you have to try to max, match your two cards with the five that are there. Any three you want to total five. And you have to have the best cards in your hand, totaling, including the two that you have. And sometimes you do what's called a bluff. Sometimes you don't really have any good cards, but you make believe you do. And you scare the people that are playing. And so you may raise, you may throw in some chips. You may scare the people to say, oh, wow, you look confident. Uh-huh. Okay. I'm in for, I'm adding a thousand dollars to the pot. I'm so confident in what I have. It's called a bluff. Sometimes you have really, sometimes you don't. No one else sees what you have. There's no way for them to know if you're bluffing or not. Sometimes a person's telling the truth, but sometimes we bluff and we go, we go in. And then they open the cards, and then they open more, and then they finally open the fifth card. And then sometimes there's a point in the game where you're bluffing, and the other player throws down a lot more money. And now you don't know what to do. Because all along, you were just, you were just you know, trying to bluff the guy. But now he's going, is he bluffing me? And usually what people do, what professionals do, is they fold. But sometimes in life, especially when it comes to poker, but it really, I think it's a metaphor for life, is sometimes we are not able to fold. Sometimes we can't fold. Sometimes we, we do the opposite. And instead of folding, instead of just saying, okay, I was just kidding, I'll lose the thousand dollars or whatever I'm in for, we double down. We put more chips in. We go bigger. We go stronger. Because I'm already this deep. I'm already this in. I can't take the L. I can't take the loss. And so we throw more chips and we'll burn more money to hopefully not have to admit that we lost the first money. This is called the decision between to fold or to double down. And in poker, it's one thing, but I think in life, human nature is that it's so hard for us to admit where we were wrong, that we made a mistake. And so often, what we'll do is we'll defend our position. Whatever it is that we were thinking, whatever it is that we thought, and we'll defend it and we'll fight for it. And sometimes in the middle where we know that it's wrong, but we just can't fold. Because to fold means that I have to negate me. It means that I have to admit that I was wrong, that I was a mistake, that I made a, a miscalculation. If my ideas, if my beliefs, if my emotions are wrong, what does that say about me? Maybe I'm wrong. And how many times a person could be dating someone that they're in hopeful in the beginning that they should go well and they put some chips in and they bet $1,000 and they go out and they put themselves out there and they make them vulnerable. And we want it to work. We're optimistic. We're hopeful. And then midway, there's a red flag. Midway, something happens. And all the people around us are yelling, get out, fold, throw away your chips, take the loss, run away from this situation, you're going to lose. But we can't fold. Can't do it. Because we made once a decision, and now we have to stick with that decision for the rest of our lives sometimes. Because we don't have the courage to be able to admit that I made a mistake. How many people in business will maybe invest in a certain stock? I'm not a financial advisor, okay? I'm a rabbi, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Please don't rely on what I'm saying here and how you deal with your stocks and your portfolio. But I'm just giving you an example about sometimes a person may invest in a certain stock and then it drops and it goes down. And instead of a person cutting their losses, they'll double down, they'll go deeper. Instead of admitting, you know, I made a mistake. And I think sometimes why we do that is because we don't believe that we can change. We don't believe that we could get something better. But if there was a deal that someone said, sell this, 
take the loss, but you'll have the money and invest it. And this other thing is so much better. If we knew there was something better, it was a better opportunity. If we believed in ourselves that maybe I could date someone better. I don't think we would settle. But sometimes we're afraid, but we don't believe in change. We don't believe that we can change. We don't believe in ourselves. How about in an argument? We're midway. Midway. We're arguing with somebody. It could be our friend. It could be a business partner. It could be a spouse. Probably a spouse. You know what they say. Marriage is a relationship where one side is right and the other is the husband. <laughs> and sometimes we're arguing. And midway, all of a sudden, we realize the light bulb in our head goes off. Oh my God, I'm wrong. <laughs> They're right. I didn't, or we maybe misjudge someone or a situation and we run in the house and we quickly jump to conclusions and we start yelling at the wrong person and then we're shown that we're wrong. Or how about maybe someone, someone comes and criticizes us about our performance, about things that we're doing, about a life choice that we're making. We just can't see it. So instead of folding, because the hardest words in life to say are, are I'm sorry. I'm wrong. I made a mistake. It's impossible almost. Almost. Because we can. But it's so difficult. And so we go in all the way. I remember one time I had a student, middle of one of his four years of high school. He decided that the school that he was in was not for him. And he wanted to go to a different school. So he tried to reach out to a few other good Jewish schools. And unfortunately, he didn't have the pull that was needed, it was too late into the application process, and they de declined him. So he came to me, asked me for help, and I said to the kid, let's call him Joe. I said, Joe, I'll help you. Give me a few days. He's like, well, I need to know, because if not, I need to apply to a public school. I said, Joe, give me a few days. I'm going to try to get you in. And it took me a few days, and I made every phone call I could. And I, and I went to every possible person that I knew had any pull in these schools. And finally, I got the kid an interview. And I called him up. I'm so excited. <laughs> I got Joe. Got great news. I got you an interview. You know what he says to me? He looks at me and he says, Rabbi, I'm sorry. It's too late. Joe, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, I thought you said, I'm going to get you in. I know, I know. But I already, I already went. I already spoke to a person in the public school. I already went there. I already invest, I already paid the $50 application fee. I already, I couldn't believe it. But this is human nature. That once we already make a decision, once we already go down a road, it is so hard for us to be able to look at that decision that we made, say, you know what? Maybe this project was all wrong. Let me start over. And so sometimes we'll destroy our future in order to justify our past. So come back to Moshe Rabbeinu for a moment. And Moshe Rabbeinu, he believes that this is the right thing. He believes we're ready. And then all of a sudden he comes down and he realizes that he was wrong. They're not ready for the Torah. And what is the right thing to do? The right thing to do is what Moshe does. To break it. Because they don't deserve it. We didn't deserve it. The right thing to do was to throw it away. But what was the easy thing to do? The normal, the human thing to do would have been if I was Moshe and this is my dream, the tablets, my whole life, I worked for this. This is my, um, this is my plaque. This is my claim to fame. These tablets is what I live for. Everyone must know about these tablets. I can't destroy history. Are you out of your mind? By the way, Moshe didn't know there would be a round two. He didn't know there was going to be a second pair. According to all he knew, his knowledge, this was it. And his whole life he worked on this piece of art, on this project, on this thing, on this plan, on this deal. Moshe Rabbeinu. If I'm Moshe, I come down from that mountain and I see the Egel. You think I'm going to break this? Out of your mind? No way. This is my dream, my baby. 
I'll break you before I break this. I'm Moshe. I go up that mountain. I, I tuck away those tablets somewhere in hiding. I come back. All right, guys. Let's work. What's, what's going on? How can we do an egg ale? I'll give them a nice day of chizuk, inspiration. I'll make them fast. When it's all over, all right, guys. You did tshuva? Good. And I'll pull out those tablets. And the greatness of Moshe Rabbeinu is he had the strength to know that sometimes it's okay to make a mistake. And it doesn't say anything about me if I erred. Because to be human means to make mistakes. Our rabbis tell us, Ezehu chacham halomed mikol adam. You know who's a chacham? You know who's really a wise person? I thought he was a wise person. A wise person is a person who's lomed mikol adam. Someone who learns from everyone. That's a simple level what our rabbis tell us. Someone wise is someone who learns from everyone. Lomed mikol adam. I saw one time something beautiful. You know who's a chacham? Halomed mikol. Someone who learns that in every situation of life, I can be adam. I'm just human. I'm human. And you know what? If you've proven to me in this conversation, and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes in an argument, you know, when men argue, they view it as a contest <laughs> that I must win. Women argue, most of the time, it's an exchange of information. So what happens when a man's arguing with his wife is she's hopeful that this will lead to something that will be productive and how to raise the children or how to better our marriage. But when a man is arguing, unfortunately, many times we view this as uh, competition is me versus you. It's a con- I have to win. And so many times we're talking to this person on the other side and we're not even listening to what they're saying. And literally as they're talking to us, we're like already, like we have no idea what, what the words coming out of their mouths are even. But we're just like thinking in our head, what is this guy saying? Because I, and like we're already thinking of like the next line that we're going to say. That we're just going to obviously throw down what they have to say now. Because there is no you, there is no other side, it's just me. And what I know and what I believe, and my side. And so, our rabbis, um, our rabbis tell us something so powerful. If you go back to Korach for a second, remember Korach was arguing with Moshe? Korach and Moshe? Well, our rabbis tell us that some arguments in history were okay. But some arguments in history were not okay. What's an argument that was not okay? The argument of Korach and his people. And what's an argument that is okay? The argument of uh, Hillel and Shammai. And Hillel and Shammai is okay. So if you're arguing like Hillel and Shammai, it's fine. But if you're arguing like Korach and, what should it say? Just say Korach and Moshe. That's not what the Mishnah says. The Mishnah says Korach and his people. Because if you ask Korach, there is no Moshe. There is no other side. There's nobody to hear. Because Av, Avs, obviously, I'm right. And nothing that you need that you say matters at all. Because I thought this through. And everything that I think is true. And so sometimes, sometimes our beliefs, unfortunately, we allow, we allow our belief to reshape reality, to reshape the facts. It was Einstein who said, if the facts don't fit the theory, change the facts. <laughs> That's what he said. And so many times in our lives, we have theories of who someone is or what someone is or how something should play out. We have a theory. And so we'll, we'll just burn every chip, every fact. We'll throw it away and we'll cherry pick the facts that prove our viewpoint. And we'll find the, the articles, the pieces of information that show that what I believe is right. Kind of like what came first, the chicken or the egg. And so sometimes what comes first, the facts or the theory. And for Moshe to be able to break the luchot and to say my theory was incorrect, that is something that is so praiseworthy. That is something that is so powerful. And so, I'll just end with a story. A story that took place actually in this community. 
But um, the names were left out, so we'll leave them out as well, although it's probably a story that many people here know, and maybe they even know the real names. But the story is about a fellow who was driving to a wedding in a well-known uh, hall, wedding hall, and he notices the lady in front of him is driving, and as they're by the valet, she's, she's distracted. She's not paying attention, she's on her phone, so she's not inching up as fast as she should be. Well, this man is very annoyed at this lady in front of her, that she's not inching up to the valet. So what he does is he literally just cuts her off. He just goes around and he takes her spot in the valet. So the lady was a little bit annoyed, but okay, no big deal. I'll get the next spot. The man gets out of his car. The lady gives him a nice, you know, honk and disregards the honk. He gets into the wedding. Now the lady pulls up to the valet and the valet comes over to her and says, ma'am, I'm sorry. That was the last car. You have to go find parking yourself. And it's like, he cannot believe it. What are you talking about? But he took my spot. I was really here. Ma'am, I'm sorry. That was the last spot. She is so upset. Well, she has to go now. She starts circling. She finds a spot. She heads to the wedding hall, walking all in her high heels. And as you can imagine, and she gets to the hall and she finds this guy and she makes a beeline. She starts yelling in front of everybody. Shame on you. You should be disgusted of yourself. Uh, you cut people. You took the last spot. And he's like, listen, honey, you shouldn't be taking, you should be distracted. You shouldn't be looking at your phone. I'm sorry, but uh, you snooze, you lose. And anyways, they got into a little fight. She walked away. He walked away. You can imagine. They avoided each other for the rest of the evening. Fast forward a few months, all of a sudden this lady gets a call, and it's this guy uh, on the other line. Hello? He says, hi. We'll call the guy uh, Cohen. Hi, it's Mr. Cohen. Is this Mrs. Levy? She says, yeah. He says, well, um, you know, remember me at the wedding? I took your spot. She's like, yeah, of course I remember you. I can't, how could I forget? Says, well, listen, I'm just I'm calling to apologize, I'm calling to say I was wrong. No, I was wrong, but no, I was wrong. Uh, and if only you would have, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I was completely at fault. I shouldn't have taken your spot. I should have been more patient. I'm sorry. And this lady was shocked. She's like, what are, you, what are you calling me now for? It's like months later. It's like, well, you know, it's right before Rosh Hashanah. And it's a time of the year that we seek forgiveness from God. And it's a time of year that we introspect to think, is there anyone else that we upset? So just calling you to just apologize. Because I know I upset you. And of course, she, of course, turned into butter and she apologized back. You know what? It's, it's okay. I shouldn't have reacted. I shouldn't have snapped at you like that. I also apologize. Okay. Chak Sameach, Chak Sameach. And they hang up. And a few months later, a Shalchanit calls Mrs. Levy. She says, Mrs. Levy, I have the most amazing guy for your son. Well, my son, everyone wants him. Must be a really good girl. Who is it? He says, it's the daughter of Mr. Cohen. The lady says, what? Mr. Cohen? That guy? Yeah. Do you know him? Would you let your son go out with his daughter? And she smiles and says, let her. Let my son go out. It would be an honor for someone in my family to marry. Someone who is so, such a gentleman, who apologized, who called. It would be my honor. And sure enough, the, guy, the boy, the girl, they went out. And today... Mr. Cohen, Mrs. Levy, they share grandchildren living in Lakewood. That is the power, my friends, of being able to say sorry, of being able to admit, to look at some things that we have done and to say, you know what? It was wrong. It was wrong. I'm not going to defend. I'm not going to justify. And I think, I think that's why at a chuppah, what is the last thing that we do under the chuppah? The Chatan gets up there and he breaks the glass. And he says, And it's a time to remember this time of the year. It's interesting that we don't have weddings in this time of the year. But whenever there is a wedding, we remember this time of the year. And why do we break a glass? Well, one reason is to remember this time of the year. But there's actually another fascinating reason, and I'll end with this. And that is because... We break the glass to remember something else historically that was once broken. What else broke? Something very famous in history. The Luchot. And so we break the glass 
to remember the broken Luchot. What in the world is a connection? I think connection is so powerful and so clear. Number one, we're breaking the, the glass to remember this time of the year. But we're also remembering how this time of the year begins. These three weeks begins with the breaking of the tablets. And we tell the Chatan and Kala that if you want to have a successful marriage, remember the lesson of the tablets. Remember Moshe Rabbeinu. Remember what he did. He was able to say, I'm wrong. He was able to take his ego out of it. He was able to have the confidence to know that just because I am wrong, it doesn't mean that, that, I, that I myself, my identity is a mistake. That just because sometimes I could have a mistake in an opinion or a theory doesn't mean anything about me personally. May Hashem bless us. May Hashem bless every couple, every chatan and kala, every person out there in business, every person out there in dating, every person that's making any decision. And how many times we are faced with this choice when in the middle of any project we are uh, forced to ask ourselves, maybe it's a mistake. Maybe it's something that I need to take myself out of. Maybe I'm biased. Maybe it's time for me to admit what's the reality. Maybe I don't need to throw away all my chips just because I lost some. Maybe I could fold and you know what? There'll be another round. There'll be another opportunity. There'll be another flop. There'll be new cards. There's another guy. There's another conversation. There's another, there's another investment. To be able to have that strength. To be able, instead of uh, doubling down, to fold. Put away our ego. Put away the mistakes that we've made. To come to terms with them. To face them. To admit and Bezat Hashem this way. Like Moshe, we will be able to look back at a life that we lived, learning from those mistakes, making a beautiful uh, choice, making a beautiful life for ourselves. Bezat Hashem to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash one step at a time. Amen. Thank you.